podcast where we kill horses virtually. Uh, with me today is our Vivek Ramkumar <laughs> and uh, Arvind Yadav. Hello. It's Arvind actually Arvind point... Raja Yadav. But okay. uh, I was well, trying to do a horse. Did no one get that? Like I was mini. Well, we kind of got that, but we didn't want to kind of... No, we were know, just sort of like, we didn't want to acknowledge the whole episode. We didn't want to encourage such behavior on this I podcast. thought I did a pretty good horse. Uh, let's, nah. yeah, I, I don't even know how to re- respond to that. But today we're going to be talking about nothing more than Arvind because he's just been to Res and we want details and we've been waiting till for the podcast. So Arvind, tell us, how was Res? Okay, so Res was, uh, is a um, expo dedicated to like mostly independent games. This time, uh, earlier it was just PC, but this time... Uh, basically, I think Sony decided they wanted to be there. So it was basically PC plus PlayStation. No Xbox uh, <laughs> presence over there. Yeah. And yeah, it was mostly focused on independent games. The only uh, sort of uh, big games were uh, Murdered Soul Suspect and mm-hmm. Infamous 2 and Titanfall. And I have absolutely no idea. Alien Isolation Titanfall. was also there, I think. Oh yeah, oh of course, Elio, oh yeah. Although I would like to forget that it was, but still. <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, no, because it's it's it was just like I feel like graphically Alien Isolation was amazing. I played on PC and the lighting and stuff especially it felt like a next generation title. Like you know, next gen bro, that kind of thing. Uh, but the problem is that the AI feels like it's still a generation behind. Like, I'm, I'm comparing this to games like Amnesia, The Dark Descent, oh, and, and other like, comparable horror games. And ultimately, the problem with it is that, see, the thing is, if you come out and say, I'm going to make Alien scary again, you have missed the boat by 20 years. I have an Alien plushie in my house. I am not going to be scared by Alien anymore. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, and and the thing is, it it has these weird, like sometimes you just have to fight robots because this is a video game and you have to fight generic enemies or like the the space time continuum. Would oh, so there are guns them. in the game. Like there are guns and the shooting and stuff. Yeah, no. So the thing is that the game is basically divided into alien sections and shoot the robots sections. Uh. And the alien AI is a bit weird. Uh, like. Sometimes it works, at the, in the expo it mostly works, and sometimes it just sort of, it feels like it's cheating, sometimes, because it, like, because it sometimes phases through walls to appear behind a few, like, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not feeling it in, for Alien, and, and judging by the sort of uh, crowd reaction at, at, at the show, I don't think anyone else is feeling it either. Hmm. But you know, like they still have time to prove us wrong, so maybe I'm not sure. Uh, they, gave, well, they gave me a good, they, they gave me a cool poster though, so that was okay. Well, that was nice. I, I have a question then about uh, Sony's presence there. Um, yeah. I know that Sony has quite a bunch, uh, a few incubator type projects. Yeah. So were they on uh, display there as well, or was it yeah. just their AAA titles? No, no, no. Uh, Sony's primary uh, sort of area was independent games on PlayStation 4. And there were a few beta games as well. The only AAA titles, the other two, uh, apart from Titanfall and and Alien Isolation, were Infamous and Murdered Soul Suspect. Apart from that, all of the stuff was independent games on Sony's booth or on anywhere, anyone else's. All right, that's good. And how, uh, okay. Um, I really want to get to how the reception of your game was and how you presented and whatnot. But before that, uh, did you see any other in- very interesting games on uh, you know uh, for any of these platforms that were independent? Yeah, there were a there were a bunch of games. Uh, Gods will be watching. I think it's an adventure game type thing. Uh, I, that was very interesting. Hotline right. Miami Two was strangely disappointing. 
because it fe- really just felt like the level pack for hotline miami 1 and now it even the pc version feels like it was made for a controller because the the pan uh, function you know you press shift and you pan the camera to see what's ahead of you is yeah. now now feels it's like it's now feels like you're moving an analog stick with your mouse instead of just moving the mouse as in hotline miami 1 So I'm not sure if that was because they made this for PlayStation 4 first or something, but yeah, no idea. Okay, and um, so okay, yeah, just just about... nothing new. Like more of Hotline Hotline Miami is good. I love Hotline Miami, but still felt underwhelming. All right, that's fair. Um, so uh, okay, let, let, the main thing that we wanted to hear about uh, is. how was it with uh you know uh with unrest um you know how did you present it where and who you know the details yeah, so, okay so our booth placement was a bit uh like unlucky i guess because we were sort of unrest was sort of in the top left corner of the the booth so and and on top of that i think uh in total about 50% people who came in there uh, played it because There was a surprisingly large amount of queue for people who wanted to play Titanfall, which I do not understand why. Because Titanfall is already out, and if you're buying a twenty pound ticket and then standing in a queue for one hour in order to play Titanfall, why not just buy Titanfall? But yeah, oh. <laughs> that was weird because like Titanfall was like EA had got the center of the. the place because if they are ea they can do it they can do yeah. that so and ea had about 12 computers or so there and there were huge queues for the whole titan fall thing right so yeah, yeah. i have absolutely no idea why yeah i expect like it's just a case of it's the biggest game there and generally yeah. that's what happens to majority of the public that comes to places like this they gravitate towards yeah. what the biggest game is and well, because the line forms up around infamous 2 or titanfall people queue for infamous 2 or titanfall no surprisingly enough uh, infamous and uh, murder souls respect did not have much lines at all like you could just pretty much uh, hang around the booth and then somebody would uh, get up and then you could go and play it so maybe a 5 minute waiting time or something That's pretty good, actually. Considering Infamous has been pretty well reviewed. Yeah. Okay. Um, guys, guys, I, I feel like I'm we're delineating a bit. I really want to know how Unrest did. Yeah. Let me first like give you the rest of the stuff. There was a Street Fighter fighting game tournament. <laughs> All right. Was, like fairly like sort of entertaining, but had was sort of in its own section, and like fighting game fans were just there most of the time. And there was a big uh, Twitch booth, which I don't know what. It was for like uh, Twitch, for, the uh, the streaming service. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know what what that was. And they were, they were, was, were they playing Pokemon? Yeah, I was about no, to I, ask I, that. Was it, it for was her? Like, uh, the TVs at the top were showing random live streams, and there were a few uh, random games people were playing. So I have no idea. Maybe the the thing was that you play the game at the bottom, and the live stream would be shown at the top. I have absolutely no idea what the purpose of the Twitch booth was, except for marketing Twitch. So I don't know about that. Which is yeah. huge with the uh, with majority of people play games these days. Though, yeah. like the Twitch booth was the the grandest booth of the Expo too. Like they had like EA was perhaps the biggest, but Twitch was like only slightly less big, and like they had a, like a complete stage, and I don't know what. Yeah, yeah, lots of stuff. And then the developer sessions were few, and uh, personally, I don't think anything like groundbreakingly uh, revelatory was shown there. It was just like uh, like famous, like Ragnar Trongvist, Mike Bithel, and uh, Ed Stern from Splash from Splash Damage, and a few. And oh yeah, Dean Hall. Dean Hall had like four talks there. Like it's, I think the developer sessions at Rest are basically just like how uh, QuakeCon is for John Carmack. It's that, but for Dean Hall. Dean Hall. Yeah, because he does. Because every like, Rest, he's yeah. there giving a shitload of keynotes. Yeah, exactly. And this was the same thing. So yeah, like that's basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he had four. Like every day, he was at at least like one uh, talk or panel or something. Yeah, no clue. So anyway, yeah, that was the general thing. Apart from that, there were a huge uh, ton of indie games, 
and yeah the show felt like it was made for independent games like that's good although I mean, this time I, i guess the pc independent games were sort of less in number because sony had sort of taken over uh so yeah but still it felt like a huge number of uh like independent games and and yeah so i i don't want to the crowd like the crowd that came to play games was it on average like what kind of gamer the more independent games queuing gamer the more mainstream gamer or everything now uh, in my opinion uh, like this is just what i saw completely anecdotal about uh, one third of the, the the show crowd uh, stopped and uh, like listened to one, one of our uh, we were three people at the under school so about one third of the show crowd perhaps in total uh, took a look at unrest the other two third would just uh, sort of you know like just walk past okay so and uh-huh. yeah we were pretty much busy all the time like uh, the show started at about 9 o'clock and ended at 7 mm-hmm. so we were basically uh, yeah all three days were just uh, yeah constantly there was someone to talk to except uh, uh like after 4 5 pm on sunday because at that time usually just everyone started heading back and stuff like that like so yeah so basically always talking to someone so yeah, this is just what i had in uh what i saw and what so yeah, one third of people who are interested in in, in independent games that's a pretty uh like solid yeah that's number. a good number right that's pretty yeah. encouraging actually Yeah. How was it like meeting your team? Do you hate them now that you've met them in real life? No, they were pretty cool. Yeah, they were pretty much exactly how uh, like I imagined them to be, I guess. <laughs> and oh, when so when they met you at the airport, time, they didn't yeah. like just start her- hurling racial slurs at you and say go back home. No, no. Yeah, no, you can't do that in England. Like you would probably get arrested. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. All right, tell us about unrest. They just, I think, is just getting angry that we're not talking about how the game. Okay. Was. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we were. Uh, so the unrest booth was arranged with a big poster, and we had, and we were also selling merch. Uh, yeah, merch didn't sold like completely gangbusters or anything, but we managed to sold like ten, uh, twelve T-shirts and like ten, twelve of each poster. Yeah, just the ten to twelve. Where do you where do you get those uh, posters and T-shirts printed out, Arvind? Uh, yeah, there is a shop that I know. It's it's a design shop. They cool. they do all sorts of stuff here. I'm basically trying to drag out you talking about Andres reception for as long as possible. Uh-huh. We stage us off now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so yeah, there was a uh, yeah uh, yeah there was a, a journalist from the Observer and PC Gamer Print Edition who really uh-huh. liked it. And then there was and then yeah there were a bunch of like. Every day, about fifteen to twenty uh, people with press passes came in, and most of them liked it. Like uh, the only uh, sort of sore points in general for people who are like pathfinding, which is completely understandable because I sort of just uh, coded pathfinding two days before going to rest, so it was a total hack job. Just uh. yeah. and yeah, and yeah, it wasn't even yeah. The people who played with WASD, the pathfinding isn't applicable to them because you can just Walk wherever you want. So yeah, yeah. the people who played with point and click controls, yeah, the pathfinding for those was yeah pretty understandable why they felt like that. And did you find yeah, that like uh, for most of the people playing the game, did they play it as a point and click adventure? Like what kind of game? What did they perceive it as? Uh, now this is uh, mostly uh, it was just like I for some people I told them you can play with with the mouse, and for some people I. I told them you can play with WSD. Did that change random. the way they they like? Did that change the way they saw the game? Did the people who played with keyboard no, think it was really. an RPG? Okay, no, not really. Because because the thing is, as soon as the the conversation and dialogue started, the game starts with the dialogue and stuff, right? So as yeah. soon as that started, they knew uh, that okay, this is uh, a role playing game. And and I and I gave them the elevator pitch, which like I can, I guess I can sort of repeat here the elevator pitch. Yeah. So in the one line version was that unrest is in uh, a combination of pulp fiction and planescape torment in a, in ancient India. And yeah <laughs> this line yeah this line pretty much everyone who listened to it would like do a double take and then ask me more about the game. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Like the moment you mentioned Pulp Fiction and Planescape, it's just like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> no, yeah, and it was really positively received as well because, uh, yeah, there were a ton of people. We had we were handing out uh, badges and stickers for free, and we, uh, I think we had about uh, a couple of hundred stickers and three hundred or so badges, and we almost ran out of them. And like oh. the idea was that whoever was uh, <laughs> like at least listened to my uh, one minute pitch in full would get a badge. Because you know, in every expo, there are some kids who just want to, yeah. They were, in fact, here itself, there were like 10, 20 people who just sort of, you know, uh, walked to it, grabbed the badge, and then ran away, never to be seen again. They didn't even look yeah. at the game. So yeah, but the people who were, yeah. So the, so we gave badges and stickers to the people who felt genuine, like we, who we felt were interested in the game. So yeah, we almost ran out of that of them like how many people played the game uh, over the course I of have, uh, on an estimate probably uh five six hundred that's awesome like do you, are you guys doing any tracking of like how people played the choices they made do you, no. do you, do you are you able to track that or uh no like we just saw them like uh we just uh uh stepped back a bit okay and they were uh and yeah, that, like the idea was that um, uh, there were three people, me, Ian, and Mick. So, okay. so if, if I talked, finished talking to someone and the, and the booth was empty, I would be like, hey, do you want to try it out? And in most cases, they would say yes. Only a few people who, like usually a sort of old people who were, who were sort of scared that, you know, they might not be able to play the game. Uh, yeah, they, they but the, but even with some convincing, most of them uh, agree. And and then what what I would do is that uh, I, I would hang back. I wouldn't sit next to them. I would hang back and see how they were playing the game. While Ian and Mick were talking to somebody else and waiting for when that person would rise up and leave. And then one yeah, how many computers did you have? One, just the one. Oh really? Yeah. I thought I thought you'd have more. Uh, that sucks. No, I mean they. It, you could pay for as many computers as you want. So this was since since this was our first expo, we weren't really sure about uh, how many computers we could, uh, you know, handle properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think one was uh, pretty decent because in the end, all three of us were exhausted. None of us felt like that one computer was a bottleneck because people would wait. People would easily wait, and funnily enough, like sometimes people would be like, "Hey, I'll I'll go." Uh, uh, see the rest of the expo, then I'll come back. And most of the people actually came back. That's awesome. <clears throat> That's really and, good to hear, actually. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, when, like you know, you when when you got them just with the strength of your pitch, that's pretty encouraging. And uh, and yeah, so how these expo, uh, how the crowd usually worked was that when the expo gates opened, a huge amount of people would come in. And the first couple of hours, people wouldn't wait. They would be like, yeah, I'll go see the rest of the expo. And so uh, the the I uh, the typical expo person would use the first couple of hours to just roam around. No, won't stop at any booth or anything. Just, just roam around uh, and sort of make a mental list of what interested them. Then as the, like, then after lunchtime, when the sort of, when cr the crowd started thinning, they would go to each of the expo, the, the booths which interested them, and and then they would play. So the, so the first couple of hours of each day were a blur. Like there were a ton of people, I, like I would give the pitch, I'd stop giving the pitch to one of them, and then they would be like, yeah, I'll be back. And then no, person number two, the person number three. So, hmm. so yeah, like the most... Uh, the sheer amount of people in the first couple of hours would be insane. Probably like 300 or so each day. Uh, you would just, yeah, like the like I would just start giving the pitch. A few people would hang up, like, you know, stop. And there were three of us doing this. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, like, yeah, like uh, that uh, having pe more people to give the pitch to 
is is essential in in expos because like uh, uh, baseland 2 was there uh, it, it's being published in europe by deep silver and the like deep silver slash obsidian uh, no, no deep silver slash inexcite they didn't have anyone at the booth like we like we were setting up the booth the day before and baseland 2 was installed by the when, when we came in and we never saw anyone who was remotely related to deep silver or in exile and the that's surprising uh, <laughs> and the like i mean it's, is, it's always better when you have a developer to talk to right i mean yeah. it feels like you can understand at least where they're coming from even if you yeah. maybe don't like or don't want to play the game you understand what it's about uh, yeah so the result of like uh, at deep silver's boot it was just weirdly confusing because people would just uh, like people would play for a bit and then they would uh, walk up and leave so okay. and nobody would reset the game so when i actually went to play it it was like i had absolute i was in the middle of a turn based thing and i i didn't even know where the enemies were <laughs> so and then i just sort of struggled with it for 5 minutes and then i left and then whatever mess i had made somebody else would probably just have walked up and so yeah like i i think that at least one person to reset the game's state after somebody is is essential even if they don't talk to you or something <laughs> in fact the fun thing is uh, that uh, like the presenters were given uh, were given uh, orange bands which were like different from the usual uh, bands that you get that you get from bike ticket so i was hanging around the wasteland to uh, the booth along with a few other developers and people just assumed we were the developers of wasteland because we had the orange badges <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, then, did you did you try passing yourself off as like a senior developer from Enixel? That would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, like uh, no, I just joke. I something. am on with like yeah, I am with Wasteland too. No, like I joke that yeah, Brand Fargo has just gone to Hawaii for vacation and he has outsourced outsourced it to India. So I'm stuck with <laughs> the game. <now. laughs> uh, you should have yeah. said that to like a bunch of people, and then like you know, you should have got. Ian and Mick to go like we're making this awesome game about India, and then <laughs> it's like steal customers from Wasteland too. <laughs> no, I'm I'm pretty sure that most people who were sort of uh, interested in uh, these games would because there aren't a lot of people who like buy a twenty pound twenty five pound ticket to an expo and then just like don't explore it. So I'm pretty sure every like everyone who was like yeah I. I want to see like indie indie games at least walk past our booth once. That's There brilliant. were a few people uh, like I I met three people so basically one each day who was like played for a bit and they were like where's the action? So I'm like uh, there isn't any. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then they just sort of awkwardly uh, went sort of slip by. But yeah, that's understandable. If only but yeah, if only three people say that to you then. Yeah, I guess the expo is attracting the appropriate crowd. That yeah, I it's definitely like start. attracting an indie-friendly crowd that's prepared to yeah. try an experience that's not uh, traditional, at least. Yeah. yeah, I think it's fair to say that, like, in in terms of that question being asked, there. I mean, we've kind of been conditioned by recent RPGs or just RPGs yeah. in general to always have action. You know, like yeah, you have yeah. your story bits, but you have your action, and there, you know, you. Kind of have two types of players, you know, the type who enjoy the action more than the story, and vice versa. So I think, you know, in some senses, I can see where that question was coming from. But it, yeah, it, yeah. it is nice that a lot of people, you know, uh, that wasn't on their minds actually. You know, yeah. it was more yeah. like I'm going to check this game out and see what it is for what it is, and yeah. that's you know, this is really cool to hear actually, and. Uh, like, did you, uh, did you, ex uh, you know, like, uh, did you tell people that yeah, we develop in India or we develop as a team all over the place? And no, what was the did, reaction like, everyone, to that? No, yeah, people were surprised. Like, even like there was a programmer from Creative Assembly. Uh, uh huh. Like they were there to present a Rome Total War 2 Touch Edition or something for iPads yeah. or whatever. And yeah, he was pretty surprised when he learned that all of our dev team. Like this was the first time we met, and like yeah, he talked to us for me for like forty-five uh, minutes or so. 
Nice. And like asked how the engine was coded. Like he felt it was really smooth. So, so yeah, I was like, yeah, thank you. But <laughs> yeah, and yeah, there were a ton of developers who were extremely impressed with the game. Uh, Ed Stern, who's a uh, like the head writer for Splash Damage, the mm-hmm. people who made uh, you know enemy territory quake wars and yeah stuff like that. Brink. Yeah. yeah, Brink, obviously, yeah. So he was there. He he was extremely impressed. At least I think he was, or he was lying. <laughs> but yeah, he was extremely impressed. And yeah, there were a ton of ton of de- other developers who were like we met this these really awesome. Uh, like there were sort of four brothers who were called Gang Beasts, and they were mm-hmm. making a physics-based brawler. So they were just kind of uh, two boots away from us. Yeah, though they were really nice and helpful people. Because like our team was basically lost. None of us was from Birmingham. We didn't know what, uh, like how things work over there. And yeah, they were really nice. They helped us out uh, with the trains. And yeah, pretty. Yeah, the crowd was pretty helpful. Like the 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 games next to us. Yeah, they were pretty helpful as well. And yeah, uh, the, yeah, just like incredible uh, crowd in general. Don't think there was even like one unpleasant. Developer or anything that we met. Everyone oh, was. Really Man, that's yeah. It's like overall, it sounds like you had a really good experience there. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure like uh, that, that if we had the sort of experience slash knowledge, we could have optimized our uh, presentation and stuff better. Because like on Sunday, at that time, basically our feet were sort of paining, and none of the team could stand properly. <laughs> So we just took turns on that day, and I, and I think I had a period of uh, one or two hours in which I just couldn't talk to anyone because <laughs> like I was just so mentally and like throat wise tired. So I just like I just couldn't talk to anyone. So so yeah, that, like yeah, that that probably just comes with getting uh, experience and stuff. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think. Uh... You know, I think this was, you know, uh, all of your first uh, major expo. So, you know, you would have probably gone all gung ho. But I think uh, with experience, you kind of realize how to kind of pace yourself better, or even just, you know, make conversations more concise. So yeah, but and, still, and yeah, make make conversations feel organic as opposed to make them feel kind of uh, dry and kind of. No, I don't think like, like, it yeah, becomes easier to talk to people. Once you have some experience, yeah. No, we sort of like refined our pitch uh, as the as the the show goes. Yeah, but like I mean, I don't know. There's there's I think I suppose like once you do this more and more, at at some point for a lot of people, it won't even feel like a pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You get what I'm saying? Of course, there's a danger of that, like of you becoming Donald Draper from Mad Men eventually, <laughs> like huh. this really sleek, like sleek salesman. Kind of like an ad executive type person, but uh, yeah, I mean, good with the bad. You'd be really good at selling your game to people. Yeah, yeah no, it was just uh, yeah. Now we're just sort of uh, like at this stage, I'm just following up from the the contacts I made and just the uh, whatever else that happened. So yeah, like pretty pretty good overall. I'm I'm pretty positive. And yeah, I think uh, our game was. Uh, Yeah, one of the better received on the expo. Like I have absolutely no idea to base this from, but yeah, I'm just assuming based on some of the other games that I played and like the general reaction from like what I gauged from other people. Okay, that's great though. I, I, um, this is like just incredibly awesome. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah, I don't think there had been an Indian game developer there before. Because I did not see anyone of Indian origin or just like anyone with remotely the same, uh, like, like you know, remotely the same skin color or whatever in that expo. Otherwise, <laughs> no, yeah, but it was really weird because I like based on the reactions of people when I told them that I had come come from India, like I don't think yeah, like the reaction I got was, well, it was pretty. I'm pretty. That made me pretty sure that I was the first person like. You're that. Christopher Columbus, yes. but for Indian video games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, basically, so I guess what this, we're trying to yeah. say is that he was trying <laughs> to get to America, but he ended up in England, and we don't even know how. But you know, he was trying out. to get to India, but he ended up in America. You're trying <laughs> to. Well, I don't know what you are trying to do, but you are basically they see Christopher Columbus for video games. <laughs> there, but I've yeah. basically summed up who Arvind is now. Yeah, I'm sort of hoping. Uh, yeah, and you're also going to take credit others. for someone else's work. Yeah, boo. No, I don't think that for instance, work. Oh man, I'm talking about like there'll be people who will say no. I was the first Indian game developer. Oh yeah, this. yeah, could be. So, <laughs> so um, res decide. Uh, any any other interesting news from the week? Because I've been kind of Amazon Game it. Studios. That's that's big news, man. Oh yeah. shit! Yeah. Okay, give me more Kim details. Talking so- and uh, Kim Swift have joined Amazon Game Studios. It's coming out in a big way. Oh wow! Yeah. What are what what game are Amazon even making? They're making a bunch, not just one. Uh, like I think they're getting into the original content business in a big way. I hate that word, but whatever. Uh, uh, so, they they have the, they're going to have their own service. So basically, I think they're going to sell games on Amazon. Right. Uh, and yeah, like I think they're making a MOBA. A MOBA, really? Like, I'm not one. sure. I'm not. I like. I, I've not seen what they've announced already. I, let, let me check it out. Mm. That's weird. Why would you like make get your own console for a TV or something and then make a MOBA? That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, like I mean, Sev Zero, a tower defense style strategic base building that combines fast action shooter mayhem. Mm, it could be a first person or third person type MOBA, I guess. Uh, well, we'll like, find out soon enough, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't think. Yeah. Tower defense shooter hybrid. Uh, it's a third person. Third person okay. shooter. There's a trailer out for it today. But okay. what I'm excited about is that they've hired Kim Swift of Portal fame and Clint Talking of Far Cry 2 fame. Okay. So that sounds interesting, and Amy yeah. having uh, moved to Visceral Games. A lot of people are moving and quitting their jobs right now. One of the lead, uh, uh, one of the lead Sony guys recently left. Jack, uh, I don't remember his name. Uh, Jack Tretton. Jack Tretton quit Sony recently. Oh. Wow. So many people quitting. Why? Yep. Everyone's Just uh, like I think, I think a lot of the people who are quitting, it's, it's like they've had long, good careers in games, so it's not a like. I think they're just it's time for them to do something different. Which yeah. Is fine. No, yeah, makes sense. I mean, uh, at some point you're you're going to want to you know just kind of keep something keep different. Away. Yeah, like it, that's change of scenery is what you're gonna want. Um, so I, I can understand that. Um, so basically, what we're saying is, all the people listening to us, you should probably leave games. It's time. Yeah, <laughs> it's about time. Uh, the two people who listen to us, uh, if you're in games, probably time to move out, irrespective of how long you've been in them. And uh, if you're not in games, hey, maybe you should come in. <laughs> yeah, we're really awesome, kind of. Yeah. And ignore what we said earlier about leaving, because that totally never happens. Yeah, that just applies to people who are already here. Yeah, and it won't apply to you because, like, you yeah. know, you're joining halfway through. We're, We're making doing. a very convincing argument here. But on that <laughs> note, <laughs> I think we should uh, call this podcast uh, quits. Let's say, guys. Yep. yep. Alrighty. Well, everybody who's listening, all two of you, good night. Have a great day. Whatever time it is at your end. This is Bye. Tejas signing out. This is Arvind and Vivek with me. But what? But what do we have? Nothing. What do we have? Now Tell by, yeah, that's it. We have the end. Yeah, the end. Uh, it is the end, <laughs> folks. You do not. Nothing is over. <laughs> Nothing is over. <laughs> you don't turn it off. Oh, man, we need to play that sound file. Shit. It would be perfect. <laughs>
<laughs> just so like don't play that sound file yeah. because then people will just think like you know have those random dcma notices coming in no so, yeah. i think vivek you should totally just put that in that just little sound file as i'm like okay guys good night and then you just put that sound file in <laughs> total do it do it <laughs> all right uh i'll think about it bye <laughs>